Lady Carolyn Cox is running late. Even crusaders can't escape the curse of London traffic. It's a bit like driving a sort of obstacle course instead. Time lost is time wasted. Lives are at stake. Those of the slaves of southern Sudan. My lords, I am very grateful to noble lords who are contributing to this debate. In recent years of the civil war, over one and a half million Sudanese have perished, over five million been displaced, and the numbers grow daily. Slavery is widely practiced by the NIF regime. How much longer will the international community tolerate this? Westminster seems an visiting unlikely visiting place to debate the war in Sudan. But then Carolyn Cox is no ordinary lady. When the Baroness of Queensbury thinks dining wear, it's not Wedgwood or Royal Dalton she's after. Basically got something like this, which would be a, just a good little um, billy can for about two, three people. Right now, she's shopping for a billy can. In a few days, she'll be shopping for slaves. Two and a half hours flying time from the Kenyan capital of Nairobi is Loki Chokyo, the gateway to southern Sudan. This bush town near the border has become the hub for Operation Lifeline Sudan, the United Nations multi-million dollar famine relief effort. Although the UN will not work in areas banned by the Sudanese government, some groups will. One of them is Christian Solidarity Worldwide, headed by the Baroness. Because we go to the areas which are closed by the National Islamic Front regime to the major aid organizations, you often find people there who have absolutely nothing in the way of medical supplies at all. That can come off. Thank you. Carolyn Cox has made more than 20 covert trips into southern Sudan areas controlled by the Rebel Sudan People's Liberation Movement, or FPLM. Well, I'm trying to find myself a pair of shorts to wear. These longs are too hot. Her partner in crime, for that's how Sudan's well, National Islamic Front government <laughs> sees their slave-freeing mission, is Canadian Reverend Cal Bombay. This is his fourth trip. He swore he'd make only one. If you can't see what's going on, then leave it alone. You just can't. And if you are, you're heartless. So I, I'm not coming back, <laughs> but I probably will. Right now, however, this plane's not going anywhere. We have the problem. Stephen Wandu, a high-ranking SPLM official, and our passport into rebel-held Sudan, has bad news. They are worried about your security, my security, everybody's security. His superiors want the Baroness to abort the mission. It's too dangerous, they say. Government-sponsored Arab tribesmen have begun their seasonal slave raids in the south. I think there are risks we must take if we want to see what's Absolutely. Happening. This is a situation where we have to stand up and be counted with these raids going on. And we've done it before. We've done it before. We, we can do it again. I think anyone who has visited the Sudanese people in these terrible days cannot fail to be very humbled and very inspired by their courage, by their dignity, in spite of terrible suffering. And if you think of that suffering, you are drawn back, inevitably, as by a magnet, to do what you can to help. Our destination is Bar el Ghazal province in southern Sudan. It's home to the African Dinka people, mainly Christians and animists. They've been at war with the largely Arab Islamic North on and off now since independence in 1956. <laughs> We've been directed to land at Turale. Here, it should be safe. Safe enough, that is, for the slave traders to bring in their booty. 
Turile turns out a warm welcome. It's not often they get visitors here. We've been on the ground for barely an hour, however, when another plane arrives to ferry UN workers out. The WFP people have been evacuated from there. They're walking along the road. So Tony, you meet the WFP people on the road to bring them in here. The news is the raiders are on their way, headed for a town just seven kilometres from here. Caroline, how are you doing? The dinker of Turile know what that means. So does Carolyn Cox. This was the scene the Baroness and SPLM rebel fighters encountered here last year, just days after a raid. The bodies were all there heaped up. They were just covered with thorn bushes to protect them from the vultures. Others were just lying in the river lull, rotting corpses massed up. As far as you could walk, there were fresh corpses, women and children, who had obviously been trying to run away and had been followed, mowed down, slaughtered. And it went on for miles. This is all that remains of a Dinka home after the raiders came through last year. There were hundreds of armed men on horseback who came thundering through the village, setting it alight, killing the men, capturing the women and children and dragging them north as war booty for a life of slavery. It sounds like a medieval horror story, but for many southern Sudanese, this is the reality of life today. Akwaj Matiang and her children were captured in last year's attack. They were marched ten days north, given food mixed with sand and urine, beaten if they slowed. Then they were sent to work for different masters. Two months ago, Akwaj managed to escape with two of her three children, but not before she was forcibly circumcised a barbaric procedure more appropriately known as genital mutilation. These young southerners are off to the northern front. They'll tell you they're fighting for political, cultural and religious freedom from an oppressive Islamic regime. But more than anything else, the civil war in Sudan is about economics, about who controls the fertile and oil-rich lands of the south. Southern Sudan could be the breadbasket of the Horn of Africa. Yet today, the Dinka look to the heavens for their food. Without international assistance, many would starve. While nature has played a part in this famine, the real cause is the destruction and displacement of war. Slave or hostage taking has been a feature of intertribal conflict here for centuries. What's new, according to the Baroness, is the government's support of it. Slavery was there beforehand. I mean, this is not a new creation. But the use of slavery as part of the war against the peoples of the south and the borderlands has been escalated dramatically by the government's active encouragement and particularly by providing the raiders with the Kalashnikov automatic rifles, which the local people have no protection against. We've decided to take our chances in Turile. The imminent onslaught of raiders was, it seems, just a dreadful rumour. 
that indicates is how fragile the piece is, uh, in what constant state of terror the people are living. We're off to see Stephen Wandu. He's been liaising with his contacts, trying to organise a time and place to link up with the slave traders. And then we can arrange for them to just do this. There are problems. The traders at this time of the year are not are reluctant to bring the slaves deep inside. This is a reality. The traders have cold feet. They don't want to come this far into rebel-held territory. I think, oh, it's flying time there. Yeah, it's about seven minutes from It's only about seven, ten minutes from here to there. Once again, it is we're on near. the move. Ten, ten minutes. We're heading into a government-declared no-go area, just 30 kilometres from the front line and a large army garrison. Close enough for the northern regime to make good its threat to shoot the baronet out of the sky. The government denies any role in the slave trade. It's reluctant to admit slavery even exists. It says the baroness is trying to discredit the regime by staging the buyback of slaves. Oh, Lady Cook! <laughs> How are you? Happy to see you. Yeah, very well. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Lady Cox is determined to prove otherwise. Very good. Happy we've made it here. Yeah. Four days after leaving London, the Baroness has finally found what she's looking for. <laughs> Beneath one tree, the Arab traders, middlemen who claim to risk their lives either stealing or buying back the Dinka and leading them home, for a reward, of course. <laughs> and a couple of hundred metres away, 325 women and children, slaves, waiting to be redeemed. Some have been here for a day or two, others for a couple of months, on what appears to be a macabre kind of lay-by. Their stories have the same threads, murder, abuse, rape and religious coercion. Thirteen-year-old Rebecca Nyanman Matok says she was held captive for more than two years, often tied so she wouldn't escape. Her sister is her only immediate family member still alive. For a Dutane, the homecoming is bitter. Two of her children, she says, are still enslaved, somewhere in the north. Do you know why you're here with this group of people? If I told you that foreigners have come to pay money so that you can be free, what would you say? At the SPLM compound, the business is about to begin. The price has been struck, 100 US dollars a slave. And that is $1,300. So that pays for 13, 13 slaves, right? By the end of the trade, the equivalent of 51,000 Australian dollars will have changed hands. Most of it donations raised through the Reverend Bombay's Christian Broadcast Ministry. These are $100 bills, okay? One, two, three, four, 
Five. If the thought of being bought and sold disgusts Rebecca, she doesn't show it. But many in the international aid community question the morality of this practice and, like departing UN Relief Chief Carl Tinsman, worry that the Baroness may actually be fueling the slave market. It may well be that that encourages slavers to take more slaves because they know they can take them, take them away for a month or two months or three months and then bring them back and sell them back. Uh, that, that's one of the risks of this kind of approach. I just wanted to call you to the radio. To Nick Southern from Save the Children Fund has similar fears. His agency works in both government and rebel-held Sudan. He says foreigners' payment of money for slaves has come at the same time as a dramatic rise in abductions. Fifty dollars in economies which are largely pastoral, barter and exchange economies probably constitutes the sort of monies that, cash monies that people would have available for a whole year. So you're talking about huge amounts of cash. But the Baroness believes slave raiding would continue with or without her team's monetary intervention. It would go on. If we were here or not, the raiders would come and they would just clear this land of people. And that would happen. So the fact that we are here making few resources available for the redemption of some women and children isn't going to change that war or that policy. And I am going to pay for uh, 262. As for the traders, they say their motivation is to help the Dinka, not profit from them. For people supposedly terrified of reprisals, they're hardly camera shy. Okay. Whether the traders are well-intentioned or not, okay. the bottom line, according to everyone here, is that without foreign money, many slaves would not be emancipated. So thank for you, the good work you done for our children. Uh, I hope you continue to do this work for our children. Thank you. Yeah. It's possible the Baroness is being taken for a ride. It's possible too that she's unwittingly encouraging the slave raiders. But in the absence of any hard and fast data, any response to the slavery issue boils down to a personal decision. And Lady Cox has made hers. Okay, and a pocket pay. I think I'd rather live with myself, taking the flag, being in the controversy, but knowing at least that there are some people who are happy because they've been reunited with people whom they loved, who've been suffering the barbaric experience of slavery, and I'd rather live with that. For these former slaves, liberty comes with no guarantees. Like a daughter nay, they are still shackled by fear. The only thing which can buy them absolute peace of mind is an end to the long-running war between North and South. And at the moment, that seems as far off as ever. Well, I'm not a bank. You're 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 not a b